History of Guiana, Wikipedia Audio The recorded history of Guiana can be dated back to 1499, when Alonso de Ojeda's first expedition arrived from Spain at the Essequibo River. The history of Guiana has been shaped by the participation of many national and ethnic groups, as well as the colonial policies of the Spanish, French, Dutch and British. The African slave rebellions in 1763 and 1823 were seminal moments in the nation's history. Africans were enslaved and transported to Guiana as slaves, on the other hand, East Indians came as indentured laborers who worked in order to provide for their families back home. Guyana's recent history is characterized in particular by the struggle to free itself from colonial rule, and from the lingering effects of colonialism. On May 26, 1966, Guyana gained independence from Britain. The first people to reach Guyana made their way from Asia, perhaps as far back as 35,000 years ago. These first inhabitants were nomads who slowly migrated south into Central and South America. Although great civilizations later arose in the Americas, the structure of Amerindian society in the Guyanas remained relatively simple. At the time of Christopher Columbus's voyages, Guyana's inhabitants were divided into two groups, the Arawak along the coast and the Carib in the interior. One of the legacies of the indigenous peoples was the word Guyana, often used to describe the region encompassing modern Guiana as well as Suriname and French Guyana. The word, which means land of waters, is appropriate considering the area's multitude of rivers and streams. Pre-colonial Guiana and First Contacts Historians speculate that the Arawak and Carib originated in the South American hinterland and migrated northward, first to the present-day Guyanas and then to the Caribbean islands. The Arawak, mainly cultivators, hunters, and fishermen, migrated to the Caribbean islands before the Carib and settled throughout the region. The tranquility of Arawak society was disrupted by the arrival of the bellicose Carib from the South American interior. The warlike behavior of the Carib and their violent migration north made an impact. By the end of the 15th century, the Carib had displaced the Arawak throughout the islands of the Lesser Antilles. The Carib settlement of the Lesser Antilles also affected Guyana's future development. The Spanish explorers and settlers who came after Columbus found that the Arawak proved easier to conquer than the Carib, who fought hard to maintain their independence. This fierce resistance, along with a lack of gold in the Lesser Antilles, contributed to the Spanish emphasis on conquest and settlement of the Greater Antilles and the mainland. Only a weak Spanish effort was made at consolidating Spain's authority in the Lesser Antilles and the Guyanas. The Dutch were the first Europeans to settle modern-day Guiana. The Netherlands had obtained independence from Spain in the late 16th century and by the early 17th century had emerged as a major commercial power, trading with the fledgling English and French colonies in the Lesser Antilles. In 1616 the Dutch established the first European settlement in the area of Guiana, a trading post 25 kilometers upstream from the mouth of the Essequibo River. Other settlements followed, usually a few kilometers inland on the larger rivers. The initial purpose of the Dutch settlements was trade with the indigenous people. The Dutch aim soon changed to acquisition of territory as other European powers gained colonies elsewhere in the Caribbean. Although Guiana was claimed by the Spanish, who sent periodic patrols through the region, the Dutch gained control over the region early in the 17th century. Dutch sovereignty was officially recognized with the signing of the Treaty of Munster in 1648.
In 1621 the government of the Netherlands gave the newly formed Dutch West India Company complete control over the trading post on the Essequibo. This Dutch commercial concern administered the colony, known as Essequibo, for more than 170 years. The company established a second colony, on the Burbice River southeast of Essequibo, in 1627. Although under the general jurisdiction of this private group, the settlement, named Burbice, was governed separately. Demerara, situated between Essequibo and Burbice, was settled in 1741 and emerged in 1773 as a separate colony under direct control of the Dutch West India Company. Although the Dutch colonizers initially were motivated by the prospect of trade in the Caribbean, their possessions became significant producers of crops. The growing importance of agriculture was indicated by the export of 15,000 kilograms of tobacco from Essequibo in 1623. But as the agricultural productivity of the Dutch colonies increased, a labor shortage emerged. The indigenous populations were poorly adapted for work on plantations, and many people died from diseases introduced by the Europeans. The Dutch West India Company turned to the importation of enslaved African S, who rapidly became a key element in the colonial economy. By the 1660s, the enslaved population numbered about 2,500, the number of indigenous people was estimated at 50,000, most of whom had retreated into the vast hinterland. Although enslaved Africans were considered an essential element of the colonial economy, their working conditions were brutal. The mortality rate was high, and the dismal conditions led to more than half a dozen rebellions led by the enslaved Africans. The most famous uprising of the enslaved Africans, the Burbi Slave Uprising, began in February 1763. On two plantations on the Kenya River in Burbice, the enslaved Africans rebelled, taking control of the region. As plantation after plantation fell to the enslaved Africans, the European population fled, eventually only half of the whites who had lived in the colony remained. Led by Cuffey, the escaped enslaved Africans came to number about 3,000 and threatened European control over the Guyanas. The rebels were defeated with the assistance of troops from neighboring European colonies like from the British, French, and some. Eager to attract more settlers, in 1746 the Dutch authorities opened the area near the Demerara River to British immigrants. British plantation owners in the Lesser Antilles had been plagued by poor soil and erosion, and many were lured to the Dutch colonies by richer soils and the promise of land ownership. The influx of British citizens was so great that by 1760 the English constituted a majority of the European population of Demerara. By 1786 the internal affairs of this Dutch colony were effectively under British control, though two-thirds of the plantation owners were still Dutch. As economic growth accelerated in Demerara and Essequibo, strains began to appear in the relations between the planters and the Dutch West India Company. Administrative reforms during the early 1770s had greatly increased the cost of government. The company periodically sought to raise taxes to cover these expenditures and thereby provoked the resistance of the planters. In 1781 a war broke out between the Netherlands and Britain, which resulted in the British occupation of Burbice, Essequibo and Demerara. Some months later, France, allied with the Netherlands, seized control of the colonies. The French governed for two years, during which they constructed a new town, Longchamps, 
at the mouth of the Demerara River. When the Dutch regained power in 1784, they moved their colonial capital to Longchamps, which they renamed Stabroke. The capital was in 1812 renamed Georgetown by the British. The return of Dutch rule reignited conflict between the planters of Essequibo and Demerara and the Dutch West India Company. Disturbed by plans for an increase in the slave tax and a reduction in their representation on the colony's judicial and policy councils, the colonists petitioned the Dutch government to consider their grievances. In response, a special committee was appointed, which proceeded to draw up a report called the Concept Plan of Redress. This document called for far-reaching constitutional reforms and later became the basis of the British governmental structure. The plan proposed a decision-making body to be known as the Court of Policy. The judiciary was to consist of two courts of justice, one serving Demerara and the other Essequibo. The membership of the Court of Policy and of the Courts of Justice would consist of company officials and planters who owned more than 25 slaves. The Dutch Commission that was assigned the responsibility of implementing this new system of government returned to the Netherlands with extremely unfavourable reports concerning the Dutch West India Company's administration. The company's charter therefore was allowed to expire in 1792 and the concept plan of redress was put into effect in Demerara and Essequibo. Renamed the United Colony of Demerara and Essequibo, the area then came under the direct control of the Dutch government. Burbice maintained its status as a separate colony. The catalyst for formal British takeover was the French Revolution and the subsequent Napoleonic Wars. In 1795 the French occupied the Netherlands. The British declared war on France and in 1796 launched an expeditionary force from Barbados to occupy the Dutch colonies. The British takeover was bloodless and local Dutch administration of the colony was left relatively uninterrupted under the constitution provided by the concept plan of redress. Colonial Guiana Both Burbice and the United Colony of Demerara and Essequibo were under British control from 1796 to 1802. By means of the Treaty of Amiens, both were returned to Dutch control. Peace was short-lived, however. War between Britain and France resumed in less than a year, and in 1803 the United Colony and Burbice were seized once more by British troops. At the London Convention of 1814, both colonies were formally ceded to Britain. In 1831, Burbice and the United Colony of Demerara and Essequibo were unified as British Guyana. The colony would remain under British control until independence in 1966. When Britain gained formal control over what is now Guyana in 1814, it also became involved in one of Latin America's most persistent border disputes. At the London Convention of 1814, the Dutch surrendered the United Colony of Demerara and Essequibo and Burbice to the British, a colony which had the Essequibo River as its west border with the Spanish colony of Venezuela. Although Spain still claimed the region, the Spanish did not contest the treaty because they were preoccupied with their own colony's struggles for independence. In 1835 the British government asked German explorer Robert Hermann Schomburg to map British Guyana and mark its boundaries. As ordered by the British authorities, Schomburg began British Guyana's western boundary with Venezuela at the mouth of the Orinoco River, although all the Venezuelan maps showed the Essequibo River as the east border of the country.
A map of the British colony was published in 1840. Venezuela protested, claiming the entire area west of the Essequibo River. Negotiations between Britain and Venezuela over the boundary began, but the two nations could reach no compromise. In 1850 both agreed not to occupy the disputed zone. The discovery of gold in the contested area in the late 1850s reignited the dispute. British settlers moved into the region and the British Guyana Mining Company was formed to mine the deposits. Over the years, Venezuela made repeated protests and proposed arbitration, but the British government was uninterested. Venezuela finally broke diplomatic relations with Britain in 1887 and appealed to the United States for help. The British at first rebuffed the United States government's suggestion of arbitration, but when President Grover Cleveland threatened to intervene according to the Monroe Doctrine, Britain agreed to let an international tribunal arbitrate the boundary in 1897. For two years, the tribunal consisting of two Britons, two Americans, and a Russian studied the case in Paris. Their 3-2 decision, handed down in 1899, awarded 94% of the disputed territory to British Guyana. Venezuela received only the mouths of the Orinoco River and a short stretch of the Atlantic coastline just to the east. Although Venezuela was unhappy with the decision, a commission surveyed a new border in accordance with the award, and both sides accepted the boundary in 1905. The issue was considered settled for the next half century. Political, economic, and social life in the 19th century was dominated by a European planter class. Although the smallest group in terms of numbers, Members of the plantocracy had links to British commercial interests in London and often enjoyed close ties to the governor, who was appointed by the monarch. The plantocracy also controlled exports and the working conditions of the majority of the population. The next social stratum consisted of a small number of freed slaves, many of mixed African and European heritage, in addition to some Portuguese merchants. At the lowest level of society was the majority, the African slaves who lived and worked in the countryside, where the plantations were located. Unconnected to colonial life, small groups of Amerindians lived in the hinterland. Colonial life was changed radically by the demise of slavery. Although the international slave trade was abolished in the British Empire in 1807, slavery itself continued. In what is known as the Demerara Rebellion of 1823-10, 13,000 slaves in Demerara Essequibo rose up against their oppressors. Although the rebellion was easily crushed, the momentum for abolition remained and by 1838 total emancipation had been effected. The end of slavery had several ramifications. Most significantly, many former slaves rapidly departed the plantations. Some ex-slaves moved to towns and villages, feeling that field labor was degrading and inconsistent with freedom but others pooled their resources to purchase the abandoned estates of their former masters and created village communities. Establishing small settlements provided the new Afro-Guyanese communities an opportunity to grow and sell food, an extension of a practice under which slaves had been allowed to keep the money that came from the sale of any surplus produce. The emergence of an independent-minded Afro-Guyanese peasant class, however, threatened the planters' political power, inasmuch as the planters no longer held a near monopoly on the colony's economic activity. Emancipation also resulted in the introduction of new ethnic and cultural groups into British Guyana, 
the departure of the Afro-Guyanese from the sugar plantations soon led to labor shortages. After unsuccessful attempts throughout the 19th century to attract Portuguese workers from Madeira, the estate owners were again left with an inadequate supply of labor. The Portuguese had not taken to plantation work and soon moved into other parts of the economy, especially retail business, where they became competitors with the new Afro-Guyanese middle class. Some 14,000 Chinese came to the colony between 1,853 and 1912. Like their Portuguese predecessors, the Chinese forsook the plantations for the retail trades and soon became assimilated into Guyanese society. Early Colonization Transition to British Rule Concerned about the plantation's shrinking labor pool and the potential decline of the sugar sector, British authorities, like their counterparts in Dutch Guyana, began to contract for the services of poorly paid indentured workers from India. The East Indians, as this group was known locally, signed on for a certain number of years, after which, in theory, they would return to India with their savings from working in the sugar fields. The introduction of indentured East Indian workers alleviated the labor shortage and added another group to Guyana's ethnic mix. Origins of the Border Dispute with Venezuela The Early British Colony and the Labor Problem Political and Social Awakenings 19th Century British Guyana Political and Social Changes in the Early 20th Century The Constitution of the British Colony favored the white planters. Planter political power was based in the Court of Policy and the two Courts of Justice, established in the late 18th century under Dutch rule. The Court of Policy had both legislative and administrative functions and was composed of the governor, three colonial officials, and four colonists, with the governor presiding. The Courts of Justice resolved judicial matters, such as licensing and civil service appointments, which were brought before them by petition. The Court of Policy and the Courts of Justice, controlled by the plantation owners, constituted the centre of power in British Guyana. The colonists who sat on the Court of Policy and the Courts of Justice were appointed by the Governor from a list of nominees submitted by two electoral colleges. In turn, the seven members of each college of electors were elected for life by those planters possessing 25 or more slaves. Though their power was restricted to nominating colonists to fill vacancies on the three major governmental councils, these electoral colleges provided a setting for political agitation by the planters. Raising and dispersing revenue was the responsibility of the combined court which included members of the Court of Policy and six additional financial representatives appointed by the College of Electors. In 1855, the Combined Court also assumed responsibility for setting the salaries of all government officials. This duty made the Combined Court a centre of intrigues resulting in periodic clashes between the Governor and the planters. Pre-Independence Government other Guyanese began to demand a more representative political system in the 19th century. By the late 1880s, pressure from the new Afro-Guyanese middle class was building for constitutional reform. In particular, there were calls to convert the Court of Policy into an assembly with ten elected members, to ease voter qualifications, and to abolish the College of Electors. Reforms were resisted by the planters, led by Henry K. Davson, owner of a large plantation. In London the planters had allies in the West India Committee and also in the West India Association of Glasgow, both presided over by proprietors with major interests in British Guyana.
Constitutional revisions in 1891 incorporated some of the changes demanded by the reformers. The planters lost political influence with the abolition of the College of Electors and the relaxation of voter qualification. At the same time, the Court of Policy was enlarged to 16 members, eight of these were to be elected members whose power would be balanced by that of eight appointed members. The combined court also continued, consisting, as previously, of the Court of Policy and six financial representatives who were now elected. To ensure that there would be no shift of power to elected officials, the governor remained the head of the Court of Policy, the executive duties of the Court of Policy were transferred to a new executive council, which the governor and planters dominated. The 1891 revisions were a great disappointment to the colony's reformers. As a result of the 1892 elections, the membership of the new combined court was almost identical to that of the previous one. The next three decades saw additional, although minor, political changes. In 1897 the secret ballot was introduced. A reform in 1909 expanded the limited British Guyana electorate, and for the first time, Afro-Guyanese constituted a majority of the eligible voters. Political changes were accompanied by social change and jockeying by various ethnic groups for increased power. The British and Dutch planters refused to accept the Portuguese as equals and sought to maintain their status as aliens with no rights in the colony, especially voting rights. The political tensions led the Portuguese to establish the Reform Association. After the anti-Portuguese riots of 1898, the Portuguese recognized the need to work with other disenfranchised elements of Guyanese society, in particular the Afro-Guyanese. By around the start of the 20th century, Organizations including the Reform Association and the Reform Club began to demand greater participation in the colony's affairs. These organizations were largely the instruments of a small but articulate emerging middle class. Although the new middle class sympathized with the working class, the middle class political groups were hardly representative of a national political or social movement. Indeed, Working class grievances were usually expressed in the form of riots. The 1905 Ruimbelt riots rocked British Guyana. The severity of these outbursts reflected the workers' widespread dissatisfaction with their standard of living. The uprising began in late November 1905 when the Georgetown stevedores went on strike, demanding higher wages. The strike grew confrontational, and other workers struck in sympathy, creating the country's first urban-rural worker alliance. On November 30, crowds of people took to the streets of Georgetown, and by December 1, 1905, now referred to as Black Friday, the situation had spun out of control. At the plantation Ruimvelt, close to Georgetown, a large crowd of porters refused to disperse when ordered to do so by a police patrol and a detachment of artillery. The colonial authorities opened fire, and four workers were seriously injured. Word of the shootings spread rapidly throughout Georgetown and hostile crowds began roaming the city, taking over a number of buildings. By the end of the day, Seven people were dead and seventeen badly injured. In a panic, the British administration called for help. Britain sent troops, who finally quelled the uprising. Although the stevedores strike failed, the riots had planted the seeds of what would become an organized trade union movement. Even though World War I was fought far beyond the borders of British Guyana, the war altered Guyanese society.
The Afro-Guyanese who joined the British military became the nucleus of an elite Afro-Guyanese community upon their return. World War I also led to the end of East Indian indentured service. British concerns over political stability in India and criticism by Indian nationalists that the program was a form of human bondage caused the British government to outlaw indentured labour in 1917. Development of Political Parties In the closing years of World War I, the colony's first trade union was formed. The British Guyana Labour Union was established in 1917 under the leadership of H.N. Critchlow and led by Alfred A. Thorne. Formed in the face of widespread business opposition, the BGLU at first mostly represented Afro-Guyanese dock workers. Its membership stood around 13,000 by 1920 and it was granted legal status in 1921 under the Trades Union Ordinance. Although recognition of other unions would not come until 1939, the BGLU was an indication that the working class was becoming politically aware and more concerned with its rights. The Second Trade Union, the British Guyana Workers' League, was established in 1931 by Alfred A. Thorne, who served as the League's leader for 22 years. The League sought to improve the working conditions for people of all ethnic backgrounds in the colony. Most workers were of West African, East Indian, Chinese, and Portuguese descent, and had been brought to the country under a system of forced or indentured labor. Chetty Jagan After World War I new economic interest groups began to clash with the combined court. The country's economy had come to depend less on sugar and more on rice and bauxite, and producers of these new commodities resented the sugar planters' continued domination of the combined court. Meanwhile, the planters were feeling the effects of lower sugar prices and wanted the combined court to provide the necessary funds for new drainage and irrigation programs. To stop the bickering and resultant legislative paralysis, in 1928 the colonial office announced a new constitution that would make British Guyana a crown colony under tight control of a governor appointed by the colonial office. The combined court and the court of policy were replaced by a legislative council with a majority of appointed members. To middle class and working class political activists, this new constitution represented a step backward and a victory for the planters. Influence over the governor, rather than the promotion of a particular public policy, became the most important issue in any political campaign. Lyndon Forbes Burnham Founding of the PAC and PPP The First PPP Government The Great Depression of the 1930s brought economic hardship to all segments of Guyanese society. All of the colony's major exports — sugar, rice, and bauxite — were affected by low prices, and unemployment soared. As in the past, the working class found itself lacking a political voice during a time of worsening economic conditions. By the mid-1930s, British Guyana and the whole British Caribbean were marked by labour unrest and violent demonstrations. In the aftermath of riots throughout the British West Indies, a royal commission under Lord Moyne was established to determine the reasons for the riots and to make recommendations. In British Guyana, the Moyne Commission questioned a wide range of people, including trade unionists, Afro-Guyanese professionals and representatives of the Indo-Guyanese community. The commission pointed out the deep division between the country's two largest ethnic groups, the Afro-Guyanese and the Indo-Guyanese. The largest group, the Indo-Guyanese, consisted primarily of rural rice producers or merchants, they had retained the country's traditional culture and did not participate in national politics. <laughs>
The Afro-Guyanese were largely urban workers or bauxite miners, they had adopted European culture and dominated national politics. To increase representation of the majority of the population in British Guyana, the Moyne Commission called for increased democratization of government as well as economic and social reforms. The Moyne Commission report in 1938 was a turning point in British Guyana. It urged extending the franchise to women and persons not owning land and encouraged the emerging trade union movement. However, many of the Moyne Commission's recommendations were not immediately implemented because of the outbreak of World War II and because of British opposition. With the fighting far away, the period of World War II in British Guyana was marked by continuing political reform and improvements to the national infrastructure. The governor, Sir Gordon Leatham, created the country's first 10-year development plan, reduced property qualifications for office holding and voting, and made elective members a majority on the Legislative Council in 1943. Under the aegis of the Lend-Lease Act of 1941, a modern air base was constructed by United States troops. By the end of World War II, British Guyana's political system had been widened to encompass more elements of society and the economy's foundations had been strengthened by increased demand for bauxite. At the end of World War II, political awareness and demands for independence grew in all segments of society. The immediate post-war period witnessed the founding of Guyana's major political parties. The People's Progressive Party was founded on January 1, 1950. Internal conflicts developed in the PPP, and in 1957 the People's National Congress was created as a split-off. These years also saw the beginning of a long and acrimonious struggle between the country's two dominant political personalities, Chetty Jigan and Lyndon Forbes Burnham. Jigan had been born in Guyana in 1918. His parents were immigrants from India. His father was a driver, a position considered to be on the lowest rung of the middle stratum of Guyanese society. Jigan's childhood gave him a lasting insight into rural poverty. Despite their poor background, the senior Jigan sent his son to Queen's College in Georgetown. After his education there, Jigan went to the United States to study dentistry, graduating from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois in 1942. Jigan returned to British Guyana in October 1943 and was soon joined by his American wife, the former Janet Rosenberg, who was to play a significant role in her new country's political development. Although Jigan established his own dentistry clinic, he was soon enmeshed in politics. After a number of unsuccessful forays into Guyana's political life, Jigan became treasurer of the Manpower Citizens Association in 1945. The MPCA represented the colony's sugar workers, many of whom were Indo-Guyanese. Jigan's tenure was brief, as he clashed repeatedly with the more moderate union leadership over policy issues. Despite his departure from the MPCA a year after joining, the position allowed Jigan to meet other union leaders in British Guyana and throughout the English-speaking Caribbean. Born in 1923, Burnham was the sole son in a family that had three children. His father was headmaster of Kitty Methodist Primary School, which was located just outside Georgetown. As part of the colony's educated class, Young Burnham was exposed to political viewpoints at an early age. He did exceedingly well in school and went to London to obtain a law degree. Although not exposed to childhood poverty as was Jigan, Burnham was acutely aware of racial discrimination. <laughs>
the social strata of the urban Afro-Guyanese community of the 1930s and 1940s included a mulatto or colored elite, a black professional middle class, and, at the bottom, the black working class. Unemployment in the 1930s was high. When war broke out in 1939, many Afro-Guyanese joined the military, hoping to gain new job skills and escape poverty. When they returned home from the war, however, jobs were still scarce and discrimination was still a part of life. The springboard for Jigan's political career was the Political Affairs Committee, formed in 1946 as a discussion group. The new organization published the PAC Bulletin to promote its Marxist ideology and ideas of liberation and decolonization. The PAC's outspoken criticism of the colony's poor living standards attracted followers as well as detractors. In the November 1947 general elections, the PAC put forward several members as independent candidates. The PAC's major competitor was the newly formed British Guyana Labour Party, which, under J.B. Singh, won six of fourteen seats contested. Jigan won a seat and briefly joined the Labour Party. But he had difficulties with his new party's centre-right ideology and soon left its ranks. The Labour Party's support of the policies of the British governor and its inability to create a grassroots base gradually stripped it of Liberal supporters throughout the country. The Labour Party's lack of a clear-cut reform agenda left a vacuum, which Jigan rapidly moved to fill. Turmoil on the colony's sugar plantations gave him an opportunity to achieve national standing. After the June 16, 1948 police shootings of five Indo-Guyanese workers at Enmore, close to Georgetown, the PAC and the Guyana Industrial Workers' Union organized a large and peaceful demonstration, which clearly enhanced Jigan's standing with the Indo-Guyanese population. After the PAC, Jigan's next major step was the founding of the People's Progressive Party in January 1950. Using the PAC as a foundation, Jigan created from it a new party that drew support from both the Afro-Guyanese and Indo-Guyanese communities. To increase support among the Afro-Guyanese, Forbes Burnham was brought into the party. The PPP's initial leadership was multi-ethnic and left of center, but hardly revolutionary. Jigan became the leader of the PPP's parliamentary group, and Burnham assumed the responsibilities of party chairman. Other key party members included Janet Jigan, Brindley Benn, and Ashton Chase, both PAC veterans. The new party's first victory came in the 1950 municipal elections, in which Janet Jigan won a seat. Chetty Jigan and Burnham failed to win seats, but Burnham's campaign made a favorable impression on many Afro-Guyanese citizens. From its first victory in the 1950 municipal election, the PPP gathered momentum. However, the party's often strident anti-capitalist and socialist message made the British government uneasy. Colonial officials showed their displeasure with the PPP in 1952 when, on a regional tour, the Jigans were designated prohibited immigrants in Trinidad and Grenada. A British commission in 1950 recommended universal adult suffrage and the adoption of a ministerial system for British Guyana. The commission also recommended that power be concentrated in the executive branch, that is, the office of the governor. These reforms presented British Guyana's parties with an opportunity to participate in national elections and form a government, but maintained power in the hands of the British-appointed chief executive. This arrangement rankled the PPP, which saw it as an attempt to curtail the party's political power. Once the new constitution was adopted, elections were set for 1953. 
the PP Peace Coalition of Lower Class Afro-Guyanese and Rural Indo-Guyanese Workers, together with elements of both ethnic groups' middle sectors, made for a formidable constituency. Conservatives branded the PPP as communist, but the party campaigned on a center-left platform and appealed to a growing nationalism. The other major party participating in the election, the National Democratic Party, was a spin-off of the League of Colored Peoples and was largely an Afro-Guyanese middle-class organization, sprinkled with middle-class Portuguese and Indo-Guyanese. The NDP, together with the poorly organized United Farmers and Workers Party and the United National Party, was soundly defeated by the PPP. Final results gave the PPP 18 of 24 seats compared with the NDP's two seats and four seats for independence. The PPP's first administration was brief. The legislature opened on May 30, 1953. Already suspicious of Jigan and the PPP's radicalism, conservative forces in the business community were further distressed by the new administration's program of expanding the role of the state in the economy and society. The PPP also sought to implement its reform program at a rapid pace, which brought the party into confrontation with the governor and with high-ranking civil servants who preferred more gradual change. The issue of civil service appointments also threatened the PPP, in this case from within. Following the 1953 victory, these appointments became an issue between the predominantly Indo-Guyanese supporters of Jigan and the largely Afro-Guyanese backers of Burnham. Burnham threatened to split the party if he were not made sole leader of the PPP. A compromise was reached by which members of what had become Burnham's faction received ministerial appointments. The PPP's introduction of the Labour Relations Act provoked a confrontation with the British. This law ostensibly was aimed at reducing intra-union rivalries, but would have favoured the GIWU, which was closely aligned with the ruling party. The opposition charged that the PPP was seeking to gain control over the colony's economic and social life and was moving to stifle the opposition. The day the act was introduced to the legislature, the GIWU went on strike in support of the proposed law. The British government interpreted this intermingling of party politics and labour unionism as a direct challenge to the constitution and the authority of the governor. The day after the act was passed, on October 9, 1953, London suspended the colony's constitution and, under pretext of quelling disturbances, sent in troops. Following the suspension of the constitution, British Guyana was governed by an interim administration consisting of small group of conservative politicians, businessmen, and civil servants that lasted until 1957. Order in the colonial government masked a growing rift in the country's main political party as the personal conflict between the PPP Stjigan and Burnham widened into a bitter dispute. In 1955 Jigan and Burnham formed rival wings of the PPP. Support for each leader was largely, but not totally, along ethnic lines. J.P. Lachman Singh, a leading Indo-Guyanese and head of the GIWU, supported Burnham, whereas Jigan retained the loyalty of a number of leading Afro-Guyanese radicals, such as Sidney King. Burnham's wing of the PPP moved to the right, leaving Jigan's wing on the left, where he was regarded with considerable apprehension by Western governments and the colony's conservative business groups. The 1957 elections held under a new constitution demonstrated the extent of the growing ethnic division within the Guyanese electorate. The revised constitution provided limited self-government, primarily through the Legislative Council. Of the Council's 24 delegates, 15 were elected, 6 were nominated, 
and the remaining three were to be ex officio members from the interim administration. The two wings of the PPP launched vigorous campaigns, each attempting to prove that it was the legitimate heir to the original party. Despite denials of such motivation, both factions made a strong appeal to their respective ethnic constituencies. The 1957 elections were convincingly won by Jigan SPPP faction. Although his group had a secure parliamentary majority, its support was drawn more and more from the Indo-Guyanese community. The faction's main planks were increasingly identified as Indo-Guyanese, more rice land, improved union representation in the sugar industry, and improved business opportunities and more government posts for Indo-Guyanese. Jigan's veto of British Guyana's participation in the West Indies Federation resulted in the complete loss of Afro-Guyanese support. In the late 1950s, the British Caribbean colonies had been actively negotiating establishment of a West Indies Federation. The PPP had pledged to work for the eventual political union of British Guyana with the Caribbean territories. The Indo-Guyanese who constituted a majority in Guyana, were apprehensive of becoming part of a federation in which they would be outnumbered by people of African descent. Jigan's veto of the federation caused his party to lose all significant Afro-Guyanese support. Burnham learned an important lesson from the 1957 elections. He could not win if supported only by the lower class, urban Afro-Guyanese. He needed middle-class allies, especially those Afro-Guyanese who backed the moderate United Democratic Party. From 1957 onward, Burnham worked to create a balance between maintaining the backing of the more radical Afro-Guyanese lower classes and gaining the support of the more capitalist middle class. Clearly, Burnham's stated preference for socialism would not bind those two groups together against Jigin, an avowed Marxist. The answer was something more basic, race. Burnham's appeals to race proved highly successful in bridging the schism that divided the Afro-Guyanese along class lines. This strategy convinced the powerful Afro-Guyanese middle class to accept a leader who was more of a radical than they would have preferred to support. At the same time, it neutralized the objections of the black working class to entering an alliance with those representing the more moderate interests of the middle classes. Burnham's move toward the right was accomplished with the merger of his PPP faction and the United Democratic Party into a new organization, the People's National Congress. Following the 1957 elections, Jigan rapidly consolidated his hold on the Indo-Guyanese community. Though candid in expressing his admiration for Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and, later, Fidel Castro Ruz, Jigan in power asserted that the PPP's Marxist-Leninist principles must be adapted to Guyana's own particular circumstances. Jigan advocated nationalization of foreign holdings, especially in the sugar industry. British fears of a communist takeover, however, caused the British governor to hold Jigan's more radical policy initiatives in check. The 1961 elections were a bitter contest between the PPP, the PNC, and the United Force, a conservative party representing big business, the Roman Catholic Church, and Amerindian, Chinese, and Portuguese voters. These elections were held under yet another new constitution that marked a return to the degree of self-government that existed briefly in 1953. It introduced a bicameral system boasting a wholly elected 35-member Legislative Assembly and a 13-member Senate to be appointed by the Governor. The post of Prime Minister was created and was to be filled by the majority party in the Legislative Assembly. With the strong support of the Indo-Guyanese population, 
the PPP again won by a substantial margin, gaining 20 seats in the Legislative Assembly, compared to 11 seats for the PNC and 4 for the UF. Jigen was named Prime Minister. Jigen's administration became increasingly friendly with communist and leftist regimes, for instance, Jigen refused to observe the United States embargo on communist Cuba. After discussions between Jigen and Cuban revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara in 1960 and 1961, Cuba offered British Guyana loans and equipment. In addition, the Jigen administration signed trade agreements with Hungary and the German Democratic Republic. From 1961 to 1964, Jigen was confronted with a destabilization campaign conducted by the PNC and UF. In addition to domestic opponents of Jigen, an important role was played by the American Institute for Free Labor Development, which was alleged to be a front for the CIA. Various reports say that Eiffel, with a budget of US $800,000, maintained anti-Jigan labor leaders on its payroll, as well as an Eiffel trained staff of 11 activists who were assigned to organize riots and destabilize the Jigan government. Riots and demonstrations against the PPP administration were frequent, and during disturbances in 1962 and 1963 mobs destroyed part of Georgetown, doing $40 million in damage. To counter the MPCA with its link to Burnham, the PPP formed the Guyanese Agricultural Workers' Union. This new union's political mandate was to organize the Indo-Guyanese sugarcane field workers. The MPCA immediately responded with a one-day strike to emphasize its continued control over the sugar workers. The PPP government responded to the strike in March 1964 by publishing a new labor relations bill almost identical to the 1953 legislation that had resulted in British intervention. Regarded as a power play for control over a key labor sector, introduction of the proposed law prompted protests and rallies throughout the capital. Riots broke out on April 5. They were followed on April 18 by a general strike. By May 9, the governor was compelled to declare a state of emergency. Nevertheless, the strike and violence continued until July 7, when the Labor Relations Bill was allowed to lapse without being enacted. To bring an end to the disorder, the government agreed to consult with union representatives before introducing similar bills. These disturbances exacerbated tension and animosity between the two major ethnic communities and made a reconciliation between Jigen and Burnham an impossibility. Jigen's term had not yet ended when another round of labor unrest rocked the colony. The pro-PPPGIWU, which had become an umbrella group of all labor organizations, called on sugar workers to strike in January 1964. To dramatize their case, Jigen led a march by sugar workers from the interior to Georgetown. This demonstration ignited outbursts of violence that soon escalated beyond the control of the authorities. On May 22, the governor finally declared another state of emergency. The situation continued to worsen, and in June the governor assumed full powers, rushed in British troops to restore order, and proclaimed a moratorium on all political activity. By the end of the turmoil, 160 people were dead and more than 1,000 homes had been destroyed. In an effort to quell the turmoil, the country's political parties asked the British government to modify the constitution to provide for more proportional representation. The colonial secretary proposed a 53-member unicameral legislature. Despite opposition from the ruling PPP, all reforms were implemented and new elections set for October 1964. As Jigen feared, 
the PPP lost the general elections of 1964. The politics of Apan Yahate, Hindi for vote for your own kind, were becoming entrenched in Guyana. The PPP won 46% of the vote and 24 seats, which made it the largest single party but short of an overall majority. However, the PNC, which won 40% of the vote and 22 seats, and the UF, which won 11% of the vote and 7 seats, formed a coalition. The socialist PNC and unabashedly capitalist UF had joined forces to keep the PPP out of office for another term. Jagan called the election fraudulent and refused to resign as Prime Minister. The constitution was amended to allow the governor to remove Jagan from office. Burnham became Prime Minister on December 14, 1964. In the first year under Forbes Burnham, conditions in the colony began to stabilize. The new coalition administration broke diplomatic ties with Cuba and implemented policies that favored local investors and foreign industry. The colony applied the renewed flow of Western aid to further development of its infrastructure. A constitutional conference was held in London, the conference set May 26. 1966 as the date for the colony's independence. By the time independence was achieved, the country was enjoying economic growth and relative domestic peace. The newly independent Guyana at first sought to improve relations with its neighbors. For instance, in December 1965 the country had become a charter member of the Caribbean Free Trade Association. Relations with Venezuela were not so placid, however. In 1962 Venezuela had announced that it was rejecting the 1,899 boundary and would renew its claim to all of Guiana west of the Essequibo River. In 1966, Venezuela seized the Guyanese half of Ancoco Island, in the Cuyuni River and two years later claimed a strip of sea along Guyana's western coast. Another challenge to the newly independent government came at the beginning of January 1969, with the Rupununi Uprising. In the Rupununi region in southwest Guyana, along the Venezuelan border, white settlers and Amerindians rebelled against the central government. Several Guyanese policemen in the area were killed, and spokesmen for the rebels declared the area independent and asked for Venezuelan aid. Troops arrived from Georgetown within days, and the rebellion was quickly put down. Although the rebellion was not a large affair, it exposed underlying tensions in the new state and the Amerindians' marginalized role in the country's political and social life. The 1968 elections allowed the PNC to rule without the UF. The PNC won 30 seats, the PPP 19 seats, and the UF 4 seats. However, many observers claimed the elections were marred by manipulation and coercion by the PNC. The PPP and UF were part of Guyana's political landscape but were ignored as Burnham began to convert the machinery of state into an instrument of the PNC. After the 1968 elections, Burnham's policies became more leftist as he announced he would lead Guyana to socialism. He consolidated his dominance of domestic policies through gerrymandering, manipulation of the balloting process, and politicalization of the civil service. A few Indo-Guyanese were co-opted into the PNC, but the ruling party was unquestionably the embodiment of the Afro-Guyanese political will. Although the Afro-Guyanese middle class was uneasy with Burnham's leftist leanings, the PNC remained a shield against Indo-Guyanese dominance. The support of the Afro-Guyanese community allowed the PNC to bring the economy under control and to begin organizing the country into cooperatives. On February 23, 
1970, Guyana declared itself a cooperative republic and cut all ties to the British monarchy. The Governor-General was replaced as head of state by a ceremonial president. Relations with Cuba were improved, and Guyana became a force in the non-aligned movement. In August 1972, Burnham hosted the Conference of Foreign Ministers of Non-Aligned Countries in Georgetown. He used this opportunity to address the evils of imperialism and the need to support African liberation movements in southern Africa. Burnham also let Cuban troops use Guyana as a transit point on their way to the war in Angola in the mid-1970s. The Interim Government In the early 1970s, electoral fraud became blatant in Guyana. PNC victories always included overseas voters, who consistently and overwhelmingly voted for the ruling party. The police and military intimidated the Indo-Guyanese. The army was accused of tampering with ballot boxes. Considered a low point in the democratic process, the 1973 elections were followed by an amendment to the constitution that abolished legal appeals to the Privy Council in London. After consolidating power on the legal and electoral fronts, Burnham turned to mobilizing the masses for what was to be Guyana's cultural revolution. A program of national service was introduced that placed an emphasis on self-reliance, loosely defined as Guyana's population feeding, clothing, and housing itself without outside help. Government authoritarianism increased in 1974 when Burnham advanced the paramountcy of the party. All organs of the state would be considered agencies of the ruling PNC and subject to its control. The state and the PNC became interchangeable, PNC objectives were now public policy. Burnham's consolidation of power in Guyana was not total, opposition groups were tolerated within limits. For instance, in 1973 the Working People's Alliance was founded. Opposed to Burnham's authoritarianism, the WPA was a multi-ethnic combination of politicians and intellectuals that advocated racial harmony, free elections, and democratic socialism. Although the WPA did not become an official political party until 1979, it evolved as an alternative to Burnham's PNC and Jagan's PPP. Jagan's political career continued to decline in the 1970s. Outmaneuvered on the parliamentary front, the PPP leader tried another tactic. In April 1975, the PPP ended its boycott of parliament with Jagan stating that the PPP's policy would change from non-cooperation and civil resistance to critical support of the Burnham regime. Soon after, Jagan appeared on the same platform with Prime Minister Burnham at the celebration of 10 years of Guyanese independence, on May 26, 1976. The Second PPP Government Despite Jagan's conciliatory move, Burnham had no intention of sharing powers and continued to secure his position. When overtures intended to bring about new elections and PPP participation in the government were brushed aside, the largely Indo-Guyanese sugar workforce went on a bitter strike. The strike was broken, and sugar production declined steeply from 1976 to 1977. The PNC postponed the 1978 elections opting instead for a referendum to be held in July 1978, proposing to keep the incumbent assembly in power. The July 1978 national referendum was poorly received. Although the PNC government proudly proclaimed that 71% of eligible voters participated and that 97% approved the referendum, other estimates put turnout at 10 to 14%. 
The low turnout was caused in large part by a boycott led by the PPP, WPA and other opposition forces. PPP re-election and debacle Burnham's control over Guyana began to weaken when the Jonestown massacre brought unwanted international attention. In the 1970s, Jim Jones, leader of the People's Temple of Christ, moved more than 1,000 of his followers from San Francisco to form Jonestown, a utopian agricultural community near Port Kaituma in western Guyana. The People's Temple of Christ was regarded by members of the Guyanese government as a model agricultural community that shared its vision of settling the hinterland and its view of cooperative socialism. The fact that the People's Temple was well equipped with openly flaunted weapons hinted that the community had the approval of members of the PNC's inner circle. Complaints of abuse by leaders of the cult prompted United States Congressman Leo Ryan to fly to Guyana to investigate. The San Francisco area representative was shot and killed by members of the People's Temple as he was boarding an airplane in Port Kaituma to return to Georgetown. Fearing further publicity, Jones and more than 900 of his followers died in a massive communal murder and suicide. The November 1978 Jonestown massacre suddenly put the Burnham government under intense foreign scrutiny, especially from the United States. Investigations into the massacre led to allegations that the Guyanese government had links to the fanatical cult. Although the bloody memory of Jonestown faded, Guyanese politics experienced a violent year in 1979. Some of this violence was directed against the WPA, which had emerged as a vocal critic of the state and of Burnham in particular. One of the party's leaders, Walter Rodney, and several professors at the University of Guyana were arrested on arson charges. The professors were soon released, and Rodney was granted bail. WPA leaders then organized the alliance into Guyana's most vocal opposition party. Independence and the Burnham Era Burnham in Power As 1979 wore on, the level of violence continued to escalate. In October Minister of Education Vincent Tika was mysteriously shot to death. The following year, Rodney was killed by a car bomb. The PNC government quickly accused Rodney of being a terrorist who had died at the hands of his own bomb and charged his brother Donald with being an accomplice. Later investigation implicated the Guyanese government, however. Rodney was a well-known leftist and the circumstances of his death damaged Burnham's image with many leaders and intellectuals in less developed countries who earlier had been willing to overlook the authoritarian nature of his government. A new constitution was promulgated in 1980. The old ceremonial post of president was abolished, and the head of government became the executive president, chosen, as the former position of prime minister had been by the majority party in the National Assembly. Burnham automatically became Guyana's first executive president and promised elections later in the year. In elections held on December 15, 1980, the PNC claimed 77% of the vote and 41 seats of the popularly elected seats, plus the 10 chosen by the regional councils. The PPP and UF won 10 and 2 seats, respectively. The WPA refused to participate in an electoral contest it regarded as fraudulent. Opposition claims of electoral fraud were upheld by a team of international observers headed by Britain's Lord Avaberry. The economic crisis facing Guyana in the early 1980s deepened considerably accompanied by the rapid deterioration of public services, infrastructure, and overall quality of life. Blackouts occurred almost daily, and water services were increasingly unsatisfactory.
The litany of Guyana's decline included shortages of rice and sugar, cooking oil, and kerosene. While the formal economy sank, the black market economy in Guyana thrived. The Cooperative Republic The Jonestown Tragedy The Last Six Years of Burnham Hoyt to Present In the midst of this turbulent period, Burnham underwent surgery for a throat ailment. On August 6, 1985, while in the care of Cuban doctors, Guyana's first and only leader since independence unexpectedly died. Despite concerns that the country was about to fall into a period of political instability, the transfer of power went smoothly. Vice President Desmond Hoyt became the new executive president and leader of the PNC. His initial tasks were threefold, to secure authority within the PNC and national government, to take the PNC through the December 1985 elections, and to revitalize the stagnant economy. Hoyt's first two goals were easily accomplished. The new leader took advantage of factionalism within the PNC to quietly consolidate his authority. The December 1985 elections gave the PNC 79% of the vote and 42 of the 53 directly elected seats. Eight of the remaining 11 seats went to the PPP, two went to the UF, and one to the WPA. Charging Fraud the opposition boycotted the December 1986 municipal elections. With no opponents, the PNC won all 91 seats in local government. Revitalizing the economy proved more difficult. As a first step, Hoyt gradually moved to embrace the private sector, recognizing that state control of the economy had failed. Hoyt's administration lifted all curbs on foreign activity and ownership in 1988. Although the Hoyt government did not completely abandon the authoritarianism of the Burnham regime, it did make certain political reforms. Hoyt abolished overseas voting and the provisions for widespread proxy and postal voting. Independent newspapers were given greater freedom and political harassment abetted considerably. Former U.S. President Jimmy Carter visited Guyana to lobby for the resumption of free elections, and on October 5, 1992, a new National Assembly and Regional Councils were elected in the first Guyanese election since 1964 to be internationally recognized as free and fair. Chetty Jigan of the PPP was elected and sworn in as president on October 9, 1992, reversing the monopoly Afro-Guyanese traditionally had over Guyanese politics. The poll was marred by violence however. A new International Monetary Fund Structural Adjustment Program was introduced which led to an increase in the GDP whilst also eroding real incomes and hitting the middle classes hard. When President Jigan died of a heart attack in March 1997, Prime Minister Samuel Hines replaced him in accordance with constitutional provisions, with his widow Janet Jigan as Prime Minister. She was then elected President on 15 December 1997 for the PPP. Desmond Hoyt's PNC contested the results however, resulting in strikes riots and one death before a CARICOM mediating committee was brought in. Janet Jigan's PPP government was sworn in on December 24 having agreed to a constitutional review and to hold elections within three years, though Hoyt refused to recognize her government. Jigan resigned in August 1999 due to ill health and was succeeded by Finance Minister Bharat Jagdeo who had been named Prime Minister a day earlier. National elections were held on March 19, 2001, three months later than planned as the election committees said they were unprepared. Fears that the violence that marred the previous election led to monitoring by foreign bodies 
including Jimmy Carter. In March incumbent President Jagdeo won the election with a voter turnout of over 90 percent. Meanwhile, tensions with Suriname were seriously strained by a dispute over their shared maritime border after Guyana had allowed oil prospectors license to explore the areas. In December 2002, Hoyt died, with Robert Corbyn replacing him as leader of the PNC. He agreed to engage in constructive engagement with Jagdeo and the PPP. Severe flooding following torrential rainfall wreaked havoc in Guyana beginning in January 2005. The downpour, which lasted about six weeks, inundated the coastal belt, caused the deaths of 34 people, and destroyed large parts of the rice and sugarcane crops. The UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean estimated in March that the country would need $415 million for recovery and rehabilitation. About 275,000 people, 37% of the population, were affected in some way by the floods. In May 2008, President Bharat Jagdeo was a signatory to the UNAZUR Constitutive Treaty of the Union of South American Nations. Guyana has ratified the treaty.